Hi everyone, welcome to yet another in a series of uh, training videos from, from Technodyne. In a previous video, I talked to you a little bit in general about uh, porosity. What is porosity? Tried to define it a little bit for you, uh, give you an idea of why we would even uh, want to measure it, give you some um, indication of, of what methods are, are being used out there. And today what I'd like to talk about is uh, kind of focus on the Gurley method. The Gurley method was developed sometime in the 1940s, uh, became fairly popular here in the States as a means to um, analyze what that structure of, of our paper is all about and to give us some feedback on what happens when we make some changes on the machine. Are we uh, changing the structure in such a way that it's tightening things up? Are we changing the structure in such a way that it's opening uh, the web up? So um, to, uh, to dive into that, and again, I wanted to um, s talk to you uh, specifically about what I might call the, the vintage uh, Gurley method. Today there are a number of different models, electronic models out there that will report in oil girly seconds, in seconds per two and a half of mercury, uh, will report in Sheffield units, report in a number of different units. But I want to give you an idea of what, uh, where those numbers come from, uh, how they got developed, and uh, so you can get an idea when you are using one of these more modern electronic devices, get an idea of, you know, where that information came from. So this is the vintage Gurley densometer um, on display here. Uh, this, is, this is a fairly old model that um, we've uh, kept on hand here for some displays and for other uh, reference purposes. Again, in the earlier uh, video, I, I uh, talked to you a little bit about similarities from one method to another. Uh, one of those similarities certainly is uh, developing some type of a uh, pressure drop across the, the sample in the Z direction. Another uh, similarity is using some type of clamping mechanism so we can define the area that we're going to be uh, forcing that air through. Um, so the, uh, the, the Gurley method the Gurley densometer method had a uh, uh, maybe a fairly unique way of, of creating some pressure um, independent, I guess. It's very portable. You can see I don't need any external air supply. I don't need any external electronics, anything of that sort. So what they did was if you can envision this cylinder, this outer cylinder here as being a two-walled cylinder so that we can create a cavity, if you will, all around the circumference of this, uh, this device. And in that cavity, we can put some oil inside that cavity to seal, let's say, help make our seal when we take our top cylinder, the inside cylinder, we place that inside. Now essentially what I can do is I can capture an air pocket right in here, all right? So now that air pocket can be pressurized, forced through a center tube that's designed into this cylinder, out the bottom to the clamping mechanism, which is this device here, annular rings, annular rings to define the area that I want to uh, force my air through and I'm clamping it to this device which has perforations around the inside so when I capture my sample and I'm pushing air through this direction it's going to be able to evacuate out the bottom into atmosphere one so that's that, that's one similarity that's how we generate our pressure inside this cavity as this cylinder because this is a weighted top as this cylinder drops into the outer cylinder now I create that pressure drop from the top side of my sample to the bottom side of my sample okay so uh, there are 
gradations on this cylinder here that help me define as this travels in this travels into the uh, center circle help me define the volume that's going to be um, moved through this uh, particular sample that I have on place. That volume, the early definition for that volume was 100 milliliters of air. Uh, how many seconds does it take to move 100 milliliters of air through that sample? Just to give you an idea, this small cup here is 100 milliliters in volume. Okay, It's not a lot. There's not a lot of air to move through there. When we talk about the uh, seconds that it takes to move this amount of air through that sample, uh, that's what we refer to as the girly seconds. So we place our sample into the clamp area. We clamp it up. We start our, we start our test. We release this, and this drops dependent upon the structure of that sample. It'll drop fast, it'll drop slow. And to give you an indication, if we took, let's say it's a minute of uh, time to move that 100 milliliters through, that's roughly, uh, uh, roughly 100 milliliters per minute, an engineering unit. So just trying to relate that to something that some of you might uh, already be familiar with, some type of a relationship. As the time that it takes for this to move and displace 100 milliliters a second, as that time increases, the airflow decreases. Okay, that's one thing that's a little bit difficult to understand. We have an inverse relationship between girly seconds and the actual flow that going through. To give you an idea, if you can see this uh, graph that I've dis uh, displaced here, when we talk about one minute of, um, let's say, one, you know, one minute to displace this 100 milliliters of water, we're talking about roughly 100 milliliters per minute. As we reduce, let's say, as it takes longer and longer in time, this is my time scale, my airflow that's dissipating through the sample, and I, uh, let's say a volume per a, a rate, a volume of, of uh, air per time. Now my time is increasing, and it's increasing in a logarithmic fashion. So it's not a linear relationship between airflow and the girly second, uh, but certainly it gives us a very good starting point to um, uh, very good starting point to again be in, be, begin to analyze what's happening with the structure of our paper that we're producing. <clears throat> so if I can do this and the original method described using this for papers that were um, were not rough for one per, uh, for uh, one thing but were um, rated in seconds from somewhere around five seconds to uh, let's say up to 1800 seconds. Okay, 1800 seconds turns out to be uh, roughly 30 minutes. Today's production schedules, 30 minutes would be pretty prohibitive uh, in order to get that information back out to our, our converters or our, our production people. So some things that people might have modified that I've seen. I don't know that it's recommended by the manufacturer, but let's say we reduce the volume of air. We reduce it by half. So we're 50 milliliters of air. We reduce that. So now if I have a product that under normal conditions would take me uh, roughly 1800 girly seconds, now maybe it's taken me about 600 girly seconds, which still is, is fairly um, a fairly good length of time, but now maybe I'm somewhere um, in the area of it, at least being able to get enough information back out to my production people so that they can make some timely adjustments and we can continue that production process. Okay, so this particular method, um, as I described, I have an annular ring on top, okay, I have a annular ring on the bottom that I'm clamping my sample to. When I place my sandwich, when I create my sandwich, the air pressure that I'm starting to generate is coming from the top and moving toward the bottom of the sample. 
All right. So when we talk about this being unsuitable for rough samples, if you can get an idea, my 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 schematic here is is up to, upside down to in relationship to the the Gurley method. But if you can imagine, if I'm pressurizing the top cavity up here, all right, and I have a very rough sample, all right, and I do this clamping, there's a high probability that I might be able to get some air leakage from this cavity out to atmosphere before it even goes through my sample. And that would cause some problems in my uh, accuracy of my reading. So that's, uh, that's certainly not a, uh, uh, something that I would recommend um, you try to practice with. Um, when we start to get into producing some even tighter grades, okay, this guy becomes, again, uh, somewhat um, uh, non-useful, I guess I would say. It's a, uh, I don't want to uh, dub it as something that you can't use. You start getting into some tighter grades. Now we're getting up into tens, uh, maybe a thousands of Gurley seconds. Now what uh, Teledyne Gurley had developed was another system that for, in two ways basically had the same clamping mechanism. So we're clamping the same area, and that happens to be one square inch for the, uh, for the Gurley method. In this particular case, what they've done is to increase the amount of pressure that um, we introduce to the top side of that sample. They do that in a couple of different ways. They increase the weight of this plate, this top plate of my inner uh, cylinder, and they also replace the oil that's inside my uh, outer cylinder, they replace that with mercury. Uh, so in a sense, what I was able to do was to let probably um, increase that pressure differential by somewhere around three times. Instead of somewhere around uh, one kilopascal, now I'm up to around three kilopascals of pressure differential from the top side to the bottom side. What that does is it creates a higher pressure differential which will force let's say force the air through in a more timely fashion. I'll also reduce the volume that I'm actually measuring under these under those conditions with the mercury girly. I'm measuring either 10 milliliters or I'm measuring two and a half millimeters. So a fraction of what this volume is uh, looking like. All right. So um, this particular method in the U.S. certainly is I, by far one of the more popular methods that I've seen out in the field. Um, still being used today for a number of different grades. <clears throat> um, if I'm looking at um, utilizing this um, tool, utilizing the one that contains mercury, some of the modern upgrades, I guess, that, that these folks have done is they've used an electronic timing system, whereas um, before, or the, let's say the earlier development, people were using a, a stopwatch to time this displacement, this volume displacement, from one point to another. So I use a stopwatch. As I start to get down to the, the, let's say, five second range, I'm still able to, my reaction time is still certainly capable of being able to stop and start within five second period of time. But you can imagine, if it only takes five seconds to drop this, this cylinder, this my, my system, my pressurized system, really doesn't get much, uh, much time to really stabilize and, and give me a nice even flow. So that was one of the reasons on the, uh, certainly on the more open, open side, why they uh, decided to kind of limit the functionality of this. So we've got um, a, a, a basic design that we can use for a number of different grades, take it out into the field, get information back to our production people, let them know what's happening to our structure. We have, an, uh, let's say, some more modern, some other devices that we can use, um, let's say, other um, components that we can use in order to create a higher pressure drop differential across the sample. That's certainly the key in order to get push that air through a uh, a tighter grade and still get that information out to the uh, production people. So uh, with that, that gives you, I think, the, the basic understanding of where the Gurley second came from. Uh, hopefully you'll stick around. We're going to be talking more on Sheffield
porosity. We're going to be talking some more on Benson porosity. I'll touch a little bit on the Fraser test and also on the Caressa test. Thank you very much for watching. Hopefully we'll see you back in, uh, in, a, in another video.